Welcome to this book launch of All the Leavings by Lori Easter. We are so happy to have you. I am Allison Lane. I am a book editor and author strategy coach, and I run a free Facebook group called Creative Nonfiction Community. Lori and I met through another community. We're so grateful um, to have met just recently. And then, oh my gosh, her book. Um, we are also joined by Jericho Parms, author of Lost Wax, and with Emily Armisen, Arneson Casey, author of Made Holy. Today, we're going to be talking about all the leavings and how Lori navigates both the rugged terrain of the human heart and life on the edge of wilderness. So let me introduce Jericho. Thank you, Allison, um, and welcome everyone. It is such an honor to be uh, joining Lori um, to celebrate the, the launch of this book. So I am Jericho Parms, and again, such a privilege to introduce Lori Easter, author of the debut collection of essays, All the Leavings, just out this month from Oregon State University Press. This is a book I know we're all excited to celebrate this evening, so I'm gonna try to keep this as brief as I can so we can hear from Lori. Though there's so many things I could say um, in an attempt to convey my excitement around this book and this moment for my dear friend. So here's what many of you may already know about the book. It is received praise from some of the most admirable writers of creative nonfiction out today. Brenda Miller, Sue William Silverman, Sonia Livingston, Abigail Thomas, to name just a few, all of whom have brought their own unique lens and language to describing this book. A kaleidoscope that reflects the brilliant and broken-hearted nature of life itself, says Brenda Miller. Essays full of grace, the kind that comforts the runaway, the meth addict, all those who are lost, says Sue Silverman. And as Sonia Livingston simply states, an astonishing and exquisite debut. I couldn't agree more. But here's what many of you may not yet know about this book or Lori as a writer. That behind every word, every essay, every experimental form or artfully placed reprieve is something I've come to understand about Lori, her work ethic and passion as a writer, something I can only describe as true grit. When I say grit, I mean it literally, small particles of stone or sand, bits of terrain, earth, nature, rough, small in scale, but undeniable, difficult to pin down, impossible to rub from the eye, those invisible reminders of how alive we are in the world. Lori, as anyone familiar with her work knows, lives off the grid on the edge of wilderness in Southern Oregon a landscape that infuses, inspires, and saturates, saturates in the best of ways her aesthetic as a writer. But when I say grit, I mean too, courage and resolve, strength of character. Lori is a writer who I have learned from immensely about what it means to persist, to overcome, about the fellowship of writers, about the fellowship of women, about the aliveness of place and memory, and the ways in which all of these components exist together, anger and tenderness, expansiveness and intimacy. And I know I'm not alone because this is, book, this is a book that is already reaching others because through its truth, its vulnerability and empathy, it gives us all permission to feel, to question, to seek and honor reprieve, to recognize as Lori herself writes, that to give birth to joy means also giving rise to heartache that love and loss are mirror faces reflecting one another. Lori Easter's essays have been published in Brevity, The Rumpus, Chautauqua, Hippocampus Magazine, and Under the Gum Tree, among others, and anthologized in The Shell Game, Writers Play with Borrowed Forms, and A Harp in the Stars, an anthology of lyric essays, also fresh off the press, both published by University of Nebraska Press. Her work has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net, and has been listed as a notable essay in Best American Essays. She holds degrees from Southern Oregon University and Vermont College of Fine Arts, which is where I had the pleasure of meeting her now, I think 10 years ago, um, and ever since have been fortunate enough to call her my friend. 
I know we have fellow writers and friends out here in this Zoom audience tonight, and those who are encountering Lori and her work for the first time, and you are in for a treat. Please join me in welcoming Lori Easter. Oh, Lori. <laughs> You're making me cry. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jericho. That was very, very sweet and loving. And I really appreciate your beautiful introduction. And I'm so happy to be here. And I'm happy that everybody who's here is joining us. I'm on my phone because my Zoom connection on my computer is often um, really bad and I couldn't risk not, you know, having any issues. So I can't actually see everybody um, and I wish I could, but I can't. So <laughs> I'm just trusting that um, you're here, who's here is perfect to be here. So um, anyway, thank you all so much. Lori, there are more than two dozen people in attendance right now. And there can people continue to hop on. So you are you have an audience. And before we hop into the questions, I'm wondering, could you get us started with just reading an excerpt? Something? Yes. So I am going to read the opening of the first essay, the book, um, here's the book, and it's so pretty, and I just want to acknowledge that um, the photograph was taken by my daughter, Lily, and Erin Kirk was the designer, and I think she did such a fabulous job on designing the cover. And the book opens with a prologue, but then the first essay following the prologue is titled Her Body, A Wilderness. And I'm going to read from that. And um, it, it's about my daughter, Akela had a life-threatening illness. And um, that is threaded throughout the book in multiple essays. So I figured that this was a good excerpt to read. It's quite raw and it exhibits um, a lot of my writing, the rawness and honesty. And um, so here we go. My second daughter was born on the plywood living room floor between the wood stove and bathtub, naturally, like a bear cub born in a den. However, our den on the fringe of wilderness had hot running water and lights, thanks to an on-demand propane water heater and solar electricity. Only weeks before her birth, we had expanded our rustic one-room cabin with a separate bedroom and loft. The new bedroom overlooked golden yarrow, black-eyed Susan, purple coneflower, sweet William, and the lawn, meadow, and encircling forest. Still, with all that beauty to envelop her, Akela was not ready to experience the wildness. She preferred the warmth and safety of the womb and seemed quite content to stay there. Two weeks past my due date, Ruth, my midwife, recommended I take castor oil to induce labor. So I blended vanilla ice cream and root beer with a four ounce bottle of castor oil. The carbonation and ice cream will cut the heaviness of the oil, Ruth had said. And she was right. I drank the shake quickly before the ingredients had time to separate. It was a brilliant sunny afternoon, the first day of autumn, and the yellow light shone into the kitchen where I sat at the table looking out the window at the pine and fir trees. A friend knocked on the door unexpectedly just as I was downing the drink. I lifted the glass to her. Cheers, I said, here's to going into labor. Afterward, I lay my cumbersome belly down on its side in the shade of the grass and promptly fell asleep. When I awoke a couple hours later, my bowels screamed to let loose. The castor oil had done its job, lubricating my insides 
and inducing my body to expel everything within. After several trips to the outhouse, my stomach began to contract tight and thunderous in intervals a minute apart. I'd barely catch my breath from a contraction before the roll of the next. Labor was off and running like a logging truck with no brakes sliding down the mountain. The sun set and wind began to blow in and around the trees, swirling through leaves and pine needles, singing in long, slow breaths that whistled and roared. In a white button-down shift, I walked barefoot in the cool grass hands on my belly, groaning with the wind. Steve scoured the footless clawfoot bathtub until the faded white enamel coating of the cast iron shined. I lowered myself into the warm water and lay submerged on my side. After a time, I felt a sudden expansive pop, an explosion that burst within my insides. Iridescent flecks of amniotic fluid floated over the surface of the bath water, pearlescent and glittering. Then I had to vomit. I got out of the tub, sat on a stool, and heaved into a metal bowl. The baby was coming fast now. With Steve on one side of me and my friend Hollis on the other to hold me in a squat, I began to push. But when her head emerged, the baby tried to take a breath while the rest of her body remained inside, lungs compressed, and her anterior shoulder was caught underneath my pubic bone. Get on your hands and knees, Ruth instructed. I got on all fours, mama bear style, and with deft hands, Ruth reached in to loosen the baby's shoulder from its obstruction. Push, now, she ordered. Five and a half hours after contractions began, Akela's body slipped out, the umbilical cord wrapped tightly around her neck twice. She lay cradled in Ruth's hands, limp, gray, and unresponsive, an APGAR score of one out of 10. A total APGAR score of three or below requires immediate resuscitation. Akela scored a one because she had a heartbeat. It was low and getting lower. Ruth unwound the cord and gently jostled her tiny wet body to encourage a response. But as the seconds ticked by, Akela did not breathe. Ruth gave her mouth to mouth, two little puffs. Akela's body brightened with a pink hue, just like a desert sunrise spreading from horizon toward the fading stars. She cried then, forced to accept her place in the world. With all the attention focused on the baby, nobody noticed the blood squirting out of me in sudden forceful streams. Am I supposed to be bleeding this much, I asked. No, Ruth said. She reached into her bag, pulled out a syringe, and prepared it with a dose of Pitocin. Turn over, she instructed. She jabbed the needle into the flesh of my ass. My uterus began to contract. The bleeding slowed, then stopped. They handed me the baby. For the first week, her eyes were vague as I held her. It felt like her spirit hovered outside her body, caught between the worlds, but it was a strong spirit. I could feel it. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for kicking us off with that. Let's, let's dive in. Uh, we already have people um, who want to ask questions who are texting me directly. Uh, so your book, all the Leavings is now heralded by Abigail Thomas, New York Times bestselling memoirist. And which, when she, when I read that she said, the strength and beauty of her language combined with a rare generosity of spirit, the willingness to be vulnerable, transform these pieces into something more than essays that make, makes each a kind of offering. It just struck me that that kind of acknowledgement from such a, a you know, a, a, an icon is, you know, hopefully lands with you like it did to me when I read your book twice in a week and I couldn't, I kept texting you like, what, how? So, you know, here you are, you're giving birth in this rustic cabin. 
And then you also write of destructive power of wildflower, wildfires, losing friends to cancer and AIDS and suicide and meth, encounters with birds and mountain lions and the unthinkable potential loss of a child to illness. All of these experiences are so big and emotional and yet you find inspiration and meaning from them all, even in the moment. Um, can you tell us how you went through the process of writing all the leavings? Did you did you write while it was happening? Did you heal first? Did you heal through the writing? Give us give us some help. Okay, so this book was a very long time in the process. I actually that essay, her body a wilderness. My dog keeps. He's at the door and he wants to be let out. So I just got to let him out. Otherwise he's going to keep scratching at the door. That's, no, the, that's no. the wilderness for you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, the nature calls. <laughs> so um, that essay and one other essay in the collection, I actually started um, when I was in my undergrad at SOU when I was just starting with my whole writing endeavors and learning about creative nonfiction. And of course, then I didn't know that they were going to be in a book one day, but I had aspirations to write a book um, because I always thought that I would someday um, mm -hmm. since the time I was young. Um, so in terms of each piece, I wrote individually without thinking of it as going into a book, but as I wrote more and more essays, they started, themes kept coming up and they coalesced into something that I started to see, oh, okay, this is coming together as a book. Um, that whole notion of the process in terms of healing, because there's a lot of intense subjects in the book and a lot of loss and um, grief. Um, that's a really tricky question that I think, you know, um, in the writing world, people talk about a lot with memoir and creative nonfiction. And there really, it is a m manner of creating art, but when you're writing about your life, it you're potentially processing your experiences and that can be cathartic, but that's not necessarily the purpose isn't to heal, but that there is an element of healing that happens. Um, so it's maybe a, an extra boost you get from it, hopefully, you know. <laughs> so you're capturing it in the moment and then you, when you go back to it, you have another view and an, another way in. Well, some pieces I write um, in the moment, you know, to like certain things that I want to keep that feeling and the perspective, the thoughts that I have. And then some of them, it takes me years. You know, I have to literally process through it on a personal level and um, think about it a lot before I even try to write about it. Yeah. It just, it's, there's no rhyme or reason how that unfolds for me. Wow. I'm, I just want to read to you some of the comments in the chat. So powerful, Lori. Wow. Beautifully said. Um, someone else said, Mona said, beautiful cover, and uh, there are just a lot of more, a lot more, you know, very positive reactions. I know you're looking on your phone, so I just want to keep you up to date. Yeah, um, it's hard for me to see, but thank you. <laughs> yep, Helen says, amazing lady. So Helen! <laughs> yeah, so, okay, uh, here, uh, we want to get, you know, dive deep and be, you know, get in it with you. So, we, you know, your, your book, this book is incredible and it examines really what it is to love and then to lose. And then the, the, 
you look at strength and adversity in so many ways, where does the strength come from? And does it always lead to hope and transformation? Because the wildfire, you had me at wildfire and that destruction and transformation, I was like, ah, please talk about it. Okay, so um, yeah, I don't know where the strength comes from. <laughs> I really don't know that one, sorry to say. Um, maybe just from going through hard stuff, you know, and as humans, we, we learn and we grow and, and I think we adapt and, and hopefully we incorporate strength into our approach in the world. It's maybe a means of survival, I would say for me, definitely. It's a, it's a way to survive. Um, so now I'm spacing out. I well, let me let me tee it up a different way because okay. you, you did you wrote about your personal relationships. You wrote about Akela and Lily, and then you wrote this beautiful braided theme of mountain lions and wildfires gone berserk. Okay, yeah. Talk about <laughs> talk about how me. you how you, you know, wove in the theme of transformation in these two things that we can all relate to. Well, for me, nature is just huge. You know, it always has been, and I live in nature. And so it's just, it's, you know, my life on a daily level. And I think as an essayist, um, metaphor is really huge. And, um, and it's also, partially just the way I think in terms of looking at what's going on in the world and reflecting on how that relates to the experience of being human and finding the metaphor in it. Um, and, you know, transformation, well, you asked that thing about like, is it always transformative or is it always lead to hope? And I would say, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think that there is hope in life for sure. And in at facing adversity, that's the goal, right? Is to, to get to a hopeful place so that you're not just always stuck in the darkness and the heaviness of whatever you're experiencing. Um, but I think there's a tendency for people to want happy endings. And I can't say that this book is necessarily offering a happy ending, it's, but it's offering an, a real look at what life is like in terms of, yes, there, there will be hope and there are joyful moments, but, but there's also, hard moments too and it's a lot of reflection and um, contemplation um, many of my essays are very contemplative and meditative um, and for me you know nature has a huge influence on that because that's just as a person what makes me feel good you know I feel the best when I'm in nature it's it's soothing so well in the chat mona says this is how we are as humans we have to adapt and survive or not and annie says profound profound and evocative i have pamela on facetime with me so we are watching you together and we are <laughs> amazed by you and moved by your work uh, thank you guys for keeping the chat it's spicy and, and so that um, Lori feels you. Um, and uh, Lene says, it's so nice to see your smile and hear your work, Lori. I'm so happy for you. Now, <laughs> um, so much of your work is about knowing yourself and, or finding the root of your vulnerability within a wild environment. Um, can you talk about the nature of your understanding, no pun intended, and 
the secrets that anyone can tap into if they so want to? Um, that's a Tell hard us the secret, Lori. <laughs> Tell us the secret. <laughs> um, well, I just have to say, I think like I'm honest to a fault. And so that's just something that's always, I don't know if it's always in my, uh, you know, helps me, but um, my essays are definitely honest. And in the writing of them, I'm trying to understand these experiences that I've gone through. And, you know, I, that's, what being an essayist is, and I'm sure there's many essayists with us today that will agree on this is, you know, you, you essay to figure out what you think, to, to understand and to um, really just, it's like a way of grappling with an experience. Um, and not always, sometimes it's just for the beauty of the language and the love of writing and description and you know there's just so many different styles and forms and you know it's, it can be just about making art but often um, with personal essay for me it is about figuring out and coming to an understanding and so maybe that ends up eliciting that I totally understand myself and know myself well I don't know I guess maybe I do I spend a lot of time alone you know so I think a lot I've always been a thinker I'm a Gemini I'm a thinker you know um so I don't really have a secret to offer anybody about that except to just say um write if you feel motivated to write write and don't care about what the out come is you know don't care about whether it's good or not just get your thoughts down and if that's what you feel like doing you know and um sometimes it's just for yourself and sometimes it ends up being for other people and yeah it's really great Lori. i wanted to jump in and ask a, a question here um one of the essays that really struck me was three weeks of chronology from before to after and it, it's a little bit i was thinking about it for for a few days is that your dog yeah <laughs> Does she need sorry to in? do you want to let her in no he he oh. ran off barking okay awesome. So I'm really interested in the way you use imagery and symbolism, as well as the braided narrative in this essay. And what struck me is that it's an essay about the loss of a really dear friend, Christy, um, but there's very little said about that. And so in, in kind of what, what Allison is, was getting at, and, and maybe you were talking a little bit about before, um, you know, this trick of trying to to figure out how we feel, but also to how do we make other people understand the way it feels? I, I feel like I'm always trying to do that. And you do it so kind of magically in this essay. Um, so I just wanted to see if you would read for us the last, um, the very last paragraph of the essay. It's on 123, it's, it's the after part. And then maybe tell us a little bit about how how you put that essay together if, if if that is something you, okay, you can um, recall. So one twenty three with oh, okay. starting with, with after. Sure. After. In the week after Christie's death, as I waited awaited the birth of my grandchild, who would not make his arrival until two weeks after his due date, the yard and house grew silent. First, the robins left. One morning, I awoke to the empty space of a formidable lack of peeping. No rustling in the grape leaves, no squawking for food. The wrens left a few days later. I never saw them leave, didn't see the babies make their first flight from the nest into the coral honeysuckle, teetering uncontrollably as they alighted on thin branches, the way I saw the young robins do. The robin babies perched in the pine tree across the lawn from their nest. 
They were nearly the size of their parents, but there was a freshness to them, a hesitance. They flew from branch to branch, calling out to one another, seeming to cling to the familiar of their surroundings. But that lasted just the day. By the next, they were gone. Thank you. I mean, that ending really, it struck me. It was really powerful. And you loop this, you know, you begin with the coming, the return of the birds and making the nest and the whole kind of process. And it's just such a, that essay holds so much weight and understanding for me about the loss. And yet it never, you, you say very little about the loss of Christy. So do you have thoughts on how that, do you remember writing it and how kind of, what your thought process was around it? Yes, yeah, so that was one of the essays that I actually wrote very close to the time that it was happening. It, um, so, and I titled it the way I did because I was aware that there were all these things that were happening almost simultaneously. I mean, it happened over this time frame of three weeks and a lot of um, kind of intense things that happened that were based in nature and also, you know, in my life. And um, so it's kind of the way my brain works. I'm constantly putting things together. I, I guess I'm kind of like a puzzle, puzzle maker in my head. And, um, and I just started making these connections that were uh, metaphoric connections some of it was felt kind of um this might sound woo woo but mystical connections um the owl right the owl right the owl image yeah mm -hmm. um and so I just started writing the bits and pieces and and it was happening when Christy was dying and that was a very profound thing for me because she was a very close friend as she was to other people here in attendance um so yeah that that was one that came fairly quickly and it was almost a matter of um like documentation you know and that's why the it's in pieces it's a, you know a, a segmented essay it's got the time stamps and it's like the different snapshots but they all kind of come together um so i wanted to get it down before i lost it and that's how that one came about yeah what was i think it's magical it's really it show it's the power of your intuition i think and your your subconscious brain working because it really it's just such a powerful essay thank you Lori you I'm sorry Emily were you gonna oh go ahead Allison yeah I just wanted to pop into the chat and tell you that um for first of all people are saying that I asked the hardest question so I hope that's not true <laughs> um, and other people say <laughs> I was like, no, they, so Elizabeth says, what I heard was also poetry, can't wait to read. Marianne says, Lori, you are inspiring me to write, write, write. And, <laughs> oh boy, people love, love you. Um, John Proctor says, I love that irresolution is at the heart of essaying. Uh, so great. And Mona is also a Gemini, so she's with you. Uh, <laughs> and it says, please read more. And um, I can't read who says this, but knowing the loss of Christy, that just went straight to my heart. Sorry, I think that might have been Lori or Kelly. Now, this might be a good time to talk about unconventional formats. So your, your essays are all written. They're just so inventive. There are some that are, um, there's a word search that is, that informs 
that is the first page of the essay and I got sucked into trying to do the word search before I read on and realized there was narrative and I was like oh, I'm gonna get it I'm gonna get it um there's a chronology with timestamps which Emily just read there's a list of items in relics that, that's an essay called relics and then there are these reprieves can you talk about the reprieves and what they just describe them to everyone what they mean and how you sure. think about that, maybe read one if you feel. Sure. Um, so the reprieves came about later in the process, but there's something that I had contemplated incorporating back when I was um, putting together my first complete draft of the manuscript. And I don't know why I didn't include them because I definitely kept going back and forth with including them, but I didn't. And then I did after I um, had the process of going through my peer review for publication because the book is published with a university press and that's part of um, getting a contract is they send the manuscript out for peer review and then they recommend or they don't recommend publication. And based on the feedback that I had received from my peer reviewers um, inspired me to go back to this idea of the reprieves. And originally I wanted to include the reprieves to give the reader breathing room because so many of these essays are about heavy intense topics and I was like oh god it's like boom 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 okay the reader needs a break you know and then the feedback I had gotten from the peer reviewers was that they wanted to know more about my lifestyle and so I thought that the reprieves were a good opportunity to incorporate more of that for the reader, as well as then have that be breathing room from the intensity of some of the topics. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'd be happy to read from the first reprieve if you all want to hear it. Well, Jenna says, it's such a joy to hear your work aloud and to learn more about your process. So we're getting yeses all around. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so this is the first reprieve. So the reprieves are, um, there's four of them and they're each seasonal. So there's one for each season and this is the first one and it's winter. First thing in the morning, I step outside to take a shower and find it frozen. This happens when we forget to leave the faucet running at night. Typically, it is the narrow vertical pipe that stands upright from the bathtub faucet to the shower head that freezes. Sometimes, if I'm not in a hurry to bathe, I'll just go back inside and wait for the temperature to rise and the pipe to thaw. This is not always practical. Some days are too cold and it never thaws at all, or it takes too long and I don't have the time to wait. That's when I put the kettle on the stove to boil. I pour the boiling water over the faucet valves first, so I can turn the hot valve on fully. Then I pour the water up and down the pipe and over the shower head. I hear slight cracking sounds as the ice inside the pipe begins to loosen and separate itself from the metal. Eventually, the water begins to flow, first only a few drizzles and then a full spray. We don't have a bathroom. We have the outdoor tub and shower, and we have what I call an indoor outhouse, a composting outhouse consisting of two side-by-side -side five foot deep chambers above ground built from cinder blocks on a concrete floor. It has insulated walls, a small window for air and a roof and is accessible through a multi-purpose room built to be a bathroom but never finished due to lack of funds. Often in the morning, there is a layer of ice coating the bottom of the tub. When it snows, the tub fills and instead of shoveling it out, I run the shower and the hot water dissolves the snow, which disappears down the drain. 
A few times I've been greeted by dead bats and live mice. Once we put one of the cats in the tub to catch the mouse, who then ran in erratic circles. The cat was more concerned with being in a bathtub than chasing the mouse, but the mouse did not know this and dove down the drain. We dismantled the pipe from the outside and the soggy, defeated looking mouse climbed out carefully and crept under the house. Sometimes bathing commences in the rain. There is nothing to be done for it except strip off my clothes and let water wash me clean from all directions. The hot spray intermingles with a cool mist, a gentle sprinkle, a plump drops or pelting hard pricks that feel like an attack from minute shards of ice. I have even been caught in a hailstorm. The first moments are the hardest. The peeling of layers to expose skin to frigid temperatures. The sharp inhalation of breath. The chilled feet on hard frosted ground. I'd like to believe that bathing in the cold makes for a hearty constitution and an indomitable spirit. It certainly is not for the faint of heart. Nowadays, the few times I take a bath elsewhere, I feel a bit claustrophobic, hemmed in by walls, no view, and a lack of fresh air. If given the opportunity, I don't know that I'd trade my outdoor bathing for the conventional. I think I much prefer open sky, where at night bats slip from the house's cracks and flap overhead in irregular patterns, and an occasional shooting star glides through the galaxy, where the moon and Milky Way slowly shift their locations in comparison to the silhouette of trees. And it keeps going, but I'll stop there. I muted myself because I didn't want to gasp, and but I'm I, you know, I'm now worried about your dog and the mountain lions. Now that I know <laughs> what they can do. Um, Last night, my friend saw a bobcat on my property. I just had to say that, and I missed it. I didn't see it, but she saw it. I don't think the bobcat wants you to see it. I think it wants <laughs> to wait and pounce. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the. The three, you and Emily and Jericho have been in, in a weekly writers group for years, years. And can you explain how that works? You know, how did it happen? What keeps your group so dedicated and supportive and tight knit? Well, they're so, so especially the because there are so many writers and also you know, fans. So on this, on this call. So the weekly thing hasn't been going for years. That's been going for like a year and a few months. Um, but we have been reading each other's work for years and giving feedback to one another and support. And um, that has been going on since, you know, for a decade. It's so weird to say that. It's been a decade, <laughs> crazy, but um, yeah. So because we were all in school together at Vermont College, and um, we bonded, and our work. Um, I mean, we all write very differently from one another, but I think there are similarities, and um, and we understand each other's work, and um, so it just. It's a very uh, positive working relationship, as well as we're just very tight knit friends. Um, Emily and Jericho, do you want to <laughs> step in? Well, here? I'll just I'll answer Elizabeth is asking uh, to tell to say what we do on the weekly thing. So uh -huh. we started out doing our weekly uh, Zoom meetings at the beginning of the pandemic, I think, and 
we, you know, we just get together on, on I think we meet for two, how do we meet for two hours? Yeah, two hours. Mm -hmm. We start out with one person. We'll, we'll do some writing prompts, usually two writing prompts, and we'll do some short writing and sharing. And then we'll do a half hour, 45 minutes of, of writing and then come back together and share again. And we change it up like more recently, it's been just chatting about Lori's book and then like working on something, a project we're already working on. But I think, you know, when, when you're com committed to, when you really wanna write a book and um, you wanna have somebody there to read it, like who's gonna read this enormous crazy manuscript? And so, Really, I think there was that dedication and that level of seriousness with our manuscripts that we we each we gave to each other. Um, and through that, I, and you know, when you start a group, it's you know I've been in different writing groups, um, but I think you do have to kind of have a level of commitment and trust, and then also have similar ideas about writing. So the advice lands. Yeah. I would agree with that for sure. Yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I don't think I have much to add um, other than I was really curious if any of us was gonna be able to succinctly describe what exactly we do every week because it's <laughs> it, it changes and it's a little amorphous sometimes. But um, I think it's also a, a, the ability to sort of show up somewhere and just have a level of accountability to, you know, has been huge, you know, I think for me as a writer in particular, and that's something that I think is a theme that we talk about a lot and kind of bring to that space. Um, and while I completely agree that it's, you know, having some shared sort of common language about talking about our writing, you know, being kind of essayists and, and working in similar forms or, or thinking about language in similar ways is something that really, it, brings cohesion to what we do, but I'm, I'm always sort of amazed at just how different each of our process actually is. Um, like Emily and, and Lori can like show up every week and they just produce like gold, like off the bat, you know, and I'm somebody who's like revises a bazillion times before anything's even readable, you know, and so I just sort of throw up on the page. And so we each kind of come kind of at it in really different ways, but, um, have found, you know, again, through that trust and through that familiarity um, that it really works to just be able to kind of show up and workshop. And, um, and I'm so glad that Lori read one of her reprieves because that was one of the process, you know, pieces of this book in particular that kind of came to that space each week as Lori was doing the, the kind of final stage edits of this manuscript. Um, and to me, the reprieves are some of, you know, my favorite parts of this, collection. I think it just, it pulls it all together, those pieces so beautifully. Um, the book would have been beautiful without them, but it just, that level of kind of craft and thread that goes through. And as Lori spoke so eloquently about that, that need for just space within a manuscript, you know, hearing, being able to sort of witness her process um, during that stage of the, the book construction itself was, was such an honor. So I'm really glad that you read from, from Winter. And I have to say, that's not true what Jerrica says about her writing. She'll, she'll say, oh, this isn't good. And then she reads something and it's brilliant. So I just had to say that. <laughs> well, you guys can have the humble more later. And it's fine. Uh, so Candy says, your inventive approach to each essay and how it all works into a whole is just brilliant. And Elizabeth has just ordered your book using one of the, I think the bookshop link and the Amazon link, if ever anybody's looking for it is in the top of the chat. Um, and so thank you all for that. Um, oh, and Kim, Kimmy asks, Lori, do you teach? So I'd like to move into that. I haven't been, but my plan is to, um, I'd like, I really work well with people one-on-one um, -on -one giving feedback. And I've been doing that for years on just different people's essays. And um, so I'd like to move into doing some coaching and working on um, essays, single independent essays or collections with people. So that's coming in, that's in the works for me. So Kimmy, the answer is yes. 
she does. <laughs> and Kimmy says, I want to sign up right now. And um, Lori, the answer is yes, that's great, Kimmy. You can, yes. Um, also, Lori and I will be collaborating on um, a, a workshop uh, later this season. So keep an eye out for that uh, workshop on, um, right, uh, on essays and where to pitch um, and in order to build a, a basket of bylines so that you have, you know, that your bio isn't name, no street cred wants to publish a book. You know, <laughs> you gotta pitch to be in place first, right? Uh, I wanna talk about that because Jericho and Emily and Lori, you're all published with university presses. All the Leavings is published by Oregon State University Press. And then Jericho, your book Lost Wax is with University of Georgia Press. And Emily's book Made Holy is all, also with University of Georgia, but the Price uh, Press uh, Crux series. So what can you, three, the three of you, please tell us about the publishing experience with the university press, the collaboration, the you know, the choosing the cover, the finding a market for your work with that. Can you share share with us, Lori, if you can start? So I want to mention um, that Jerica's book is also part of the Crux um, series. Uh -oh, she's frozen. Am I her. frozen? Oh, no, there you go. You were for a second, but now you're with oh, us. Okay. Um, I was just saying that Jerica's book, Lost Wax, is also part of the Crux series. Oh. Um, Okay. Yeah. So anyway, just a little detail. Um, so I've had a really positive experience working with the university press, and I'm just thrilled to be working with Oregon State University Press. They're awesome. I love everybody there, and um, they've been super supportive of me. And, um, you know, like with the cover, they asked me if I had any images that I would like them to consider, which I did, the image that I already showed. <laughs> I just have to show it off so much because I love it so much. And Lily took it and I'm just so thrilled that um, Lily's picture is on the cover. Um, and so that was a really, um, it felt like a very collaborative process and very respectful of me as an artist. Um, through the whole process. Um, so yeah, do Emily and Jericho, do you wanna chime in? Jericho, you wanna take, start us off? <laughs> sure, so again, I would, I would just, I think it's a, another good example of, um, yes, we've all published with university presses and I think all had very different experiences in some ways. Um, I think there's a lot of range of, you know, how publishing with a small independent or university press sort of plays out for me. Um, publishing with Georgia was great. Um, and the university press, sort of the, the peer review process, everything kind of has coalesced in, in ways that really have led to a lot of community um, for me as a writer. Um, to me, I think the peer review process was one that I, to this day, you know, think the book is just a better book because of that process and because other writers gave their time to read a manuscript um, for very little pay, if any, you know, just their time to just devote feedback to a manuscript um, and made it better. And since, you know, being published, I myself have served in that peer review role and um, treat it very seriously because it contributes to this larger process and this larger sort of community of making good literature. Um, and that's something that I've really loved about sort of stepping into that, into that space and into that kind of world. Um, and also just the, the ability to kind of have a lot of control and, and be a collaborator with the press um, and feel that sense of support was really important to me. And um, and went really well. And even down to the, you know, the cover process. And actually Lori and I um, Aaron Kirk was also the designer of my cover book, even though it was a different press. So that was just a nice little coincidence too. And I think she's brilliant. So. Yeah, I think, you know, I think 
when you know, I think the key is finding the right press. So like the crux series that Jericho and I published with is really look, looking for a specific kinds of more literary essays and more experimental essays. So I think that's why that worked for us. Um, so, you know, and just, I don't know, it's, I think when, for me, I, I felt like if I gave some advice on publishing with the university press, I'd say, have money to hire a publisher because they, the university press just, they do as much as they can and they do a wonderful job and you're going to get a beautiful book, but they don't really put the, they don't have the resources to put into really promoting the book. So unless you're a phenomenal self promoter, which not very many people, not many writers I know are, you'll really think about that, like take that seriously. And, but I've, you know, what Lori's, you know, or talk to Lori, cause I feel like she's done a really great job promoting this book and is gonna keep promoting it. So watching other people and what they do and, and connecting with people that are publishing right at the same time as you and trying to get that support. Cause it, it's tricky. That's so true. I have a client who is published with HarperCollins and after she handed in her whole manuscript, her next conversation with her editor was with her editor and her agent and they both said, it's time for you to hire a publicist. And she was like, what, wait? And they're like, yeah, you have to invest even when it's HarperCollins, when it's when even Simon Schuster, everyone, um, and the, take this from me, I ran PR for global brands for 25 years, the body shop, Burt's Bees, Unilever. Um, you have to be your very best marketer. And that means that your publisher is only publicizing your book. They are not publicizing you. They are not finding opportunities for you to be on panels about something else. So you have to know your worth and if you're interested in that, you can join for free the Creative Nonfiction Writers Community. We do, I share a lot of workshops and tools and resources on how you can learn to promote yourself in the very best way. Um, that's a free plug for something free. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, so I'm glad you talked about promotion because it was going to be my question. What do they do? What can they do? And there's a lot that we can do for each other and for ourselves, but mostly, you know, we're a community here. Lori and I met and I loved her work and I was, she said, hey, can you moderate this? I'm like, I'd be so honored to. So here we are. So um, I want to stay, it's a, a, we're about, um, I'd like to take some questions. And one of the questions we always get is, what are you reading now? So um, after everyone reads All the Leavings and Made Holy and Lost Wax, what will they read? Lori, what are you reading now? Okay, so I came prepared. <laughs> okay. well, and I wanna plug the, um, the anthology edited by Randon Billings Noble, A Harp in the Stars, an anthology of lyric essays. And it just came out October 1st. And um, one of my essays, Searching for Gwen, which is in my book is also in this anthology. And, and Jericho has an essay in this anthology. And many, there's 50 contributors and um, stunning essays. And I, I have not read the whole thing, but for me, it's like one of those books that I piecemeal, I read some and then I just keep going back to it. Yeah. And then I have two other books that I want to plug. <laughs> so, um, so this one is Inside Passage by Kima Waterfield. And um, I'm not sure when this came, this came out just in the past year, but I'm not sure how long it how many months it's been out. Uh, she lives in Montana, but she um, grew up in Alaska in the Inside Passage, traveling around with her mother and her siblings, um, doing the festival circuit, playing music, and um, really, really stunning writing and great storytelling. And Kima is an awesome person too. Um, and then this one I just finished. I actually listened to it. It's Crossing the River. 
Seven Stories That Saved My Life. It's a memoir by Carol Smith. And I listened to it on audio and um, it was so, it moved me so profoundly that I had to get a hard copy because I want to go through and highlight all the stunning passages and things that she says about grief. So this is a grief memoir. And it's something that is so resonant for me emotionally. It's beautifully written. Um, it's, I highly recommend. So there, those are mine that I've been into and I'm plugging, so. <laughs> awesome. Annie says, oh, I have read it. She is extraordinary, quite an amazing childhood and stunning writing. And uh, Marilyn says, Crossing the River is a lovely book. Uh, Jericho, Emily, what are you reading? Come on, do I have to unmute you? I mean, oh, hold on, hold on. I think I just have to unmute again. There you go. I just got done reading uh, <laughs> the Elena Ferrante series, the Napoleon novel. <laughs> I was obsessed with these books for like, I, I couldn't put them down just so I was going wild with some fiction and then I just reread Lori's book when I got it this week um that's where I'm at Brandon Noble says thanks so much for mentioning a harp in the stars I love that your essay searching for Gwen is in it in case you didn't know Brandon Noble is participating today hi Brandon <laughs> Jericho what are you reading um so I also have been diving back into Lori's book, of course, um, and uh, their book I just just started um, is Maggie Nelson's new book on freedom, which is already pretty like mind expanding and, and fascinating as, as I always find her work to be. So I already recommend it. Awesome. Now, if anyone wants to ask a question, you can just wave and I will unmute you. Um, so you can, I see you. And, um, and while you're gaining the courage to do that, um, Kelly says, love Ferrante, did you read Gina Frangelo's memoir, Blow Your House Down? Have I, any of you read that yet? It's on my stack right in front of me, but I haven't gotten to it yet. <laughs> got it, got it. Mona says, just finished Cloud Cuckoo Land by Anthony Doerr and I'm always reading Ursula Le Guin. So, yep. And Kelly says, I got Maggie's book and it's dense nourishment. I have to read it slowly. I totally understand that. I have been going through, where is it? Um, some books you could just, so I've been going through Gift by the Sea again um for like the third time and each line you know you you think you can skim something because it's so little and you can take it everywhere but then I realized that I haven't absorbed anything in three pages and I have to stop and go back sentence by sentence and really live it and um you know so I keep on opening and highlighting and then forcing myself to do it again and I'm about to read the anthology Moms Don't Have Time To. It's a quarantine anthology edited by Zibby Owens. Not that anybody asked me, but that's what's on my stack. That's great. I wonder if, if, if any of you have questions for Lori. Right, that's what I, I'm, that's why I'm- That's what we're trying to get. That's what we're trying to get. <laughs> Mona says, that's how I feel about Margaret Atwood's surfacing written in the 70s. Mona's usually good with a question, but she's really shy today. Um, Kelly asks, would love to hear how long it took for you to get to completion on this collection, Lori. Oh gosh. Okay. So yeah, it, I was adding up the years <laughs> and it's been about 15 years from the time that I first wrote those two drafts 
of the essays that I mentioned earlier that I wrote in my undergrad. Um, and then I graduated with my undergraduate degree in 2009. And then I took six months off and went into Vermont College's low residency program. And that was two years. And so I was actively, you know, writing all the time and working on essays that are in the book and then graduated in 2012 and then kept going from there. And I remember that um, there was this talk at Vermont College for graduates and it was about, you know, what happens next kind of thing. And somebody said that it, it takes an average of seven years after graduation to publish a book. And I was like, what, are you kidding me? Seven years, no way, that's like way too long. You know? <laughs> and here it is, uh, 10 years after graduation and now my book is just being published. So anyway, that's, yeah, it's been a long process. Lori, the questions are rolling in here. So I'm just going to scroll back and see um, if I can make sense of who's who's asking which question. Um, here we have, let's see, Mona asked, Lori, I tried writing personal essays, but changed to personal essays or essay poetry. How do you write about things that are so personal without experiencing detachment? without experiencing detachment? Um, that's a good question. You know, I would say um, it's about making art. So, you know, it's like my brain is in a different place. It's in a writing mode, it's in an art making mode as opposed to um, like journaling. You know, it's just, I think it's a different part of your brain that you're accessing. And maybe there's like, uh, there is a bit of detachment and yet, especially writing scene, it's like immersing into creating almost like a movie in my mind, but I'm translating it into words. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's answering your question or not, but whether it is or not, there are other questions. So let's, okay. um, Lene asks, Lori, what's been one of the most surprising aspects of this book journey for you? The most surprising, oh gosh, the most surprising was the fact that I almost gave up. I was at a point, mm -hmm. so um, my husband, Steve died. And I didn't write for two years. And during that time, I just really didn't care about writing anymore. And I was still submitting the manuscript out, but mm -hmm. I got to this place where I, um, I just really, I was detached. I didn't care anymore. And I was consciously like, well, maybe I'm just not meant to do this. Maybe there's something else that is for me in life. And I'll just ready, I'm ready to let go. And this little voice in my head said, submit to just five more places. And I thought, okay, because I listened to the voices in my head. And I did do that. And then two of those five places requested the manuscript and were actively pursuing publishing the manuscript. Simultaneously, you know, they were almost competing with each other. And, and one of them is Oregon State University Press. And um, so that was surprising to me that you can go through years of submitting a manuscript and getting rejected did you know over and over again and then two publishers can all of a sudden want your manuscript at the same time you just never know what's going to happen that's good that's a good reminder to just keep on going and listening to the little voices right as long as they're telling you good things right right <laughs> Yeah, you have to filter out the bad stuff. 
Um, Linda, Linda Easter asks, are you a disciplined daily writer time of day? You know, bet, what time of day is best type of person? So I'm not a daily writer. I'm not disciplined that way. Um, and for me, my best time of day to write is actually an odd time that most people I don't think like, and that's the afternoon. I'm not a morning person <laughs> and I stay up very late. I'm a night owl, but usually by the end of the day, I'm so beat, I can't spend time writing. Um, and so afternoon is best for me. I'm less productive then. Yeah. So Kelly says, I love you. Life is part of it all and has its demands. And Caitlin says, I love everything about your book. Something in particular that stood out was your crystal clear way of describing photographs. Have you always been good at that? Or is it an aspect that you return to and revise? So um, I definitely returned to some of the photographs and revised them based on some feedback that I had been given from um, an editor that I had read through the whole manuscript um, once I had my first full draft. Um, but I didn't radically change the descriptions that much. I think like when I'm describing photographs, I actually look at the photographs while I'm doing it. You know, I'm not doing it just from my memory. And um, it's kind of a practice in paying attention to detail. Um, and I love photography. I'm really big into photography. So I kind of like that um, blending of the two. Thank you. John says, I'm so glad you didn't give up, Lori. Reading your words in book form is going to be so rewarding for me. Thank you, John. <laughs> now, Annie asks, during that time of 10 years of writing and collecting essays, have you noticed a change in the essays from the beginning to the end? What would that change be? Did you use more diversity of structure later? How did structure evolve for you? So that's a great question um, because I would say, um, well, I've always been interested in playing with form and structure and that just comes naturally to me. Um, and some of the more, um, uh, the essays that are different in form like the crossword puzzle essay and the word search essay and that one that I read that ending from that's uh, three weeks of chronology. Um, those were written later. Um, so I don't know why that is that the forms I started getting more um, experimental. Um, I think maybe it's just how it evolved. I don't know. I'm a very intuitive person and intuitive writer. And so um, I just really go with that a lot. I trust my gut. And when something comes to me intuitively, I just go with it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And hallelujah for when it works. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of people here who are saying, I'm so glad you continued and that you came back to it. Marilyn says, I remember when you were asking around for publisher suggestions and I didn't realize the backstory. I'm so glad you listened to your wise voice. That is Thank true. You. Yeah. Um, here for this question, if you don't have the book yet, here's a great teaser up at the rumpus. Uh, and so that is, there's a link in the chat. If anyone wants to go to the teaser at the Rumpus, you can purchase there. Um, on Voices on Addiction, searching for Gwen is there. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> Kelly, she graciously published that piece at her column, Voices on Addiction. 
Yeah, thank you, Kelly, for that. Well, I have to say, it, this is, it's just such a, an honor to be with you, um, everyone. The, this huge congratulations to you, Lori, for this phenomenal book and launch and to your publishing partners at Oregon State University Press. Thank you to everyone who joined today. You will receive the replay through Eventbrite and a link to purchase. Um, and thank you so much to Jericho and Emily for being here and rounding out this panel. Um, don't forget to write a review on Amazon or Goodreads, or you can write a review and turn it into a byline. If you haven't done that, you can read. I, I just did it recently. And I have to tell you, if a book touches you and you have to write more than two lines about it, you can, you can certainly write 800 words and pitch Perfect. it and place it. And that way you give a little and you get a little, right? Um, so that I did it recently and it's, and, and you know that, thank you, Mona. She says, yours was great, Allison. Thank you. I'll give you your five bucks later. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, Kimmy says, how do we keep up with Lori to hear when she when she might begin teaching? Kimmy, she is available to work with you. Okay. You okay. can you can contact me at Creative Nonfiction Community on Facebook. Um, I will make sure that, let me just, I'll cut and paste the, the link in now and I will connect you to her. And then you will also be connected to me um, on Allison Lane Literary. So let me, I'm gonna, you guys talk amongst yourselves for a minute. And Allison, you can also put my link to my website. Oh, okay, yes. And there's a contact form there. Okay. Let me do that. And Emily and Jericho, do you have anything else you'd want to add while I'm going to Lori's website? I would just say it was just such an honor to be here and to be part of this celebration of you, Lori, and this book. And I couldn't be more excited. Um, everyone should go out and read it if you haven't yet. Buy a copy, write a review, tell all your friends, send copies to your family. The holidays are coming up. <laughs> I couldn't be yeah, more excited for you. I, I would echo that. I, I got the book um, Monday and read it in, you know, a couple of days and just, it's a beautiful book. It's really well done. And there's, Lori's just a very talented writer. So. Thank you yeah. all so much. <laughs> I got and stay tuned ideas. for more because she's got a whole nother book coming out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, sure. that's going to be a while, but <laughs> I might get there. <laughs> this has been so great. I'm so appreciative of everybody that has joined us today. And um, this feels really good. I'm just thrilled. And I love everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>